Uh, we are ready for the, the next lineup of uh, startup pitch. We'll start with uh, Secure Touch by, uh, by Mark Freeman. Where's the clock? That's for the slide. Hi everyone, my name is Mark Freeman, I'm VP of Sales at SecureTouch. We're an Israeli company uh, founded four years ago focusing on behavioral biometrics. This isn't an Israeli accent, obviously. This is a Scottish accent, but just to clear that up before we confuse everyone. <laughs> so we use behavioral biometrics for authentication and also for online fraud protection. So what is behavioral biometrics? Behavioral biometrics is the analysis of how Everyone, you and I, interacts with their phone, with their computer, how they move the mouse, how they type, how they swipe, how the phone moves in their hand. And on one hand, we use that to authenticate good users continuously and without friction. But we also use that understanding of how you and I, innocent regular people, act in order to detect fraud, mainly automated tools such as bots or emulators or manual fraud, which can be sophisticated, but as an individual sitting on a computer or a phone and doing something fraudulent. And the reason we can identify the fraudulent acts is because those two groups, whether it's a person or a tool, act differently than innocent people like you or I. So just quickly, our integration is very simple. We have an SDK that would be integrated into your app or your website. The data is collected, the behavioral data from the keyboard and mouse, from the gyroscope, accelerometer, and touchscreen. That is sent to our servers. And there we're looking for non-human behavior, which would signify bot attacks. We're looking for uh, virtual devices, such as emulators, which are another great fraud tool. We're looking for suspicious devices, such as a device that someone's used to try multiple logins with different credentials. We're also looking for behavioral anomalies. Behavioral anomalies can be how, do, how does a normal person interact with the website and how does a fraudster interact with the website? Okay, a fraudster will go, is doing it as a business, needs to do it quickly, needs to do it efficiently. A normal person will browse, take their time, etc. So in terms of our client base, we're focused on online uh, e-commerce. That can be companies, OTAs, online retail, ride sharing, gambling companies. For, for travel companies, we're looking at preventing account takeovers. That can be either the acquiring of the, the, the account details through dark net lists and then an automation of the checking, then using it to steal credits, steal, commit loyalty fraud, fraudulent purchases. And the second one is fraudulent guest checkout. That can be using stolen credit cards, coupon abuse, et cetera, et cetera. So that's secure touch in the three minutes. I'm wearing the T-shirt. Come and speak to me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next one, we have uh, Campin, uh, which will be presented by Do Perry. So uh, first of all, thank you, Yoron, for the introduction in the panel. Um, so back in 2017, to get away from the routine in the city, my wife, Michal, and I decided to get lost in nature with our three young kids. No hotels, no Airbnbs, just keeping it simple. Um, the simple life, think again. Um, we had to talk to camp owners who do not speak a language we do. We had to email, to call, to just walk in and try our luck. On one occasion, we had to go up mountainous roads to a campsite we thought we had made. And that is when Noga, my daughter, she, well, you know what happened next. All over me, my wife, the van. And that is when we started asking myself, isn't there simplicity for the campers and the campsites? And why don't the booking Expedia's meta searches of the world attend to a growing $20 billion market? That is when Campin was born. 
Campin is a cross-market multi-language booking platform for campsites and the outdoor ancillary services. Campers join for free. They get online presence and increased bookings. Campers, they have it simple. They book on camping and we get a success fee from the campsites. Everyone wins. But I am a camper, but I'm not a, a, a hippie. Um, as an experienced business developer, international tax consultant, major in the reserves and so on and so on, but a father, uh, I did it a hard way. Um, I traveled 10,000 kilometers door to door, surveying, interviewing people, the campers and the campsites to understand the numbers, the industry, the structure. We also did a POC online to understand the online presence. Young and old need simplicity to get, on, to get out to nature on a complex journey. But it's not simple to convert the camp owners who might still be using pen and paper to manage their business. But I'm confident, just like we converted Nancy, who was not a big believer at first. But when she uh, understood that we, Camp N will cut her communication uh, traffic by more than half, she joined like others. We have a support, an amazing supporting team for, from uh, uh, Europe, Israel, Palestine. We have a seed investor who's here from the US. Um, and with new campsites joining daily from Austria, Italy, and Portugal, we've launched camping.com. And I'm here to meet all of you, the corporations and the investors who understand the green ocean. And I'm also here for the daughters like Noga who want to get lost in nature and not online. Ami Do, founder and employee of Camping. Thank you. Thank you, Ido. Uh, next, we have uh, Mabrien by Anna Bordoza. Hi, I'm Anna Bordoza from Business, uh, Business Development Manager in Mabrien, and we are a big data analytic company. And today, I want to show you how we can help our clients by cross-analyzing different data sources to identify a new demand spot. So let's see an example. Let's have a look on Israeli incoming tourism. By official statistic data, we know that the main original market for 2018 were US, France, Russian Federation, and Germany and UK. We also know that last year, Israel launched a big advertising campaign to, to attract new visitors to the destination, focusing on three touristical products, nightlife, sunbathing, and art and culture. So taking that into consideration, and by analyzing different data sources, we could identify a new demand hotspot, Italy. And if you want to be more precise, uh, the region of Naples. Let's see how we get there. So we analyzed air capacity, and we know that Italian market is the third uh, market by number of flight seats to the destination, when the airport of Naples is the fifth airport in the country and increasing 14%. We also know that the churches of tickets from Italy to Israel have increased in 17%, when the searches specifically from the Naples to Tel Aviv are 30% up. Also from the uh, hotel review share, we know that Italian market is the first market uh, in the hotel stays from the beginning of the year, and the number of review are increased in 50% compared with the last year. From the social media, we analyzed a uh, trip advice, uh, we analyzed say, um, Instagram and uh, Twitter networking, networks, and we can uh, see that Italian market is the first market in the, for the mention shared about the destination when uh, the users from Naples show the high interest in the same product promoted by the advertising campaign, art and culture, sand basing, and nightlife. So just easily we could analyze four different data layers in order to get to the available insight and to uh, identify a new market niche. We can not only identify the precise target, but also reach it at its origin at the perfect time. We can do it by analyzing their searching and booking anticipation pattern. So we can know exactly when will be the perfect time for each market. Of course, this action uh, can enhance uh, the significantly uh, the effectiveness of the promotional campaign and also increase the direct sales. 
is just one example of so many services that we are offering. Uh, we work not only with marketing and sales department, but also advice for revenue management, expansions, or investment department. We're already four years in the market uh, working with the uh, tourism board such as uh, Indonesia, Colombia, Visit Holland, and other municipal uh, DMO, uh, DMOs. We also work with the uh, hotels change such as uh, Iberostar or Barcelona and uh, count with the uh, trust of uh, international um, partners such as MasterCard, uh, Travelport, or Orange. If you didn't do it yet, so I invite you to pass by our booth that is outside and they can show you the platform and give you more details about how we can help your business to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, next, we have Way to Vat, presented by Amos Simanto. Why, why is that? So. Yeah, this is not me. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the right one. So proceed without the presentation, or you have it? Oh, yeah. OK, guys. Uh, my name is Emo Simantov. I'm a founder and a CEO of uh, way to vat way to vat we have developed a fully automated platform for VAT GST reclaim for businesses. Uh, this is a B2B platform for uh, enterprise and SMB market. So our vision is really to challenge the VAT status quo with uh, VAT refunds uh, globally accessible to all. That means this platform should serve any company around the globe, if it's a large, medium, or small company. Today, the market is mainly, main players are doing that manually or partial manually, um, cumbersome, complicated process, and we are here to solve this problem. So just letting you know the market that we are addressing, it's about $20 billion unclaimed yearly. So tax authorities are very happy from that. So you can see uh, most of the 20 billion divided, 60% goes to SME, SMB market, and 40% goes to the enterprise market. From the six, $20 billion, travel expenses, they are the most popular expenses uh, for VAT reclaim for businesses, some for shipments, and other for marketing events or other expenses. So we develop a platform, we call it One Click to Claim, so um, our clients, employees can reclaim their VAT on any location around the globe. One click on our app, they can scan any receipts, if it's hotel receipt or invoice, uh, taxi, transportation, uh, trains, uh, restaurants, events, then it goes to our platform automatically. We do online analysis to the platform, and then we submit the reclaim in a 40 different countries. These are the countries that you can get VAT back or GST back. It's a huge vehicles for uh, governments. VAT rate runs between 8% to 27%. 8% goes mainly to the APA countries. 27% goes to uh, Scandinavian countries. In the bottom, you see the uh, all the expenses that you can reclaim or companies can reclaim. So the platform, uh, it's, um, we did end-to-end, -end, so we can get invoice for any platform, if it's your from computer, any image, uh, for web app, uh, mobile app, or scanner, you can use our application or mobile app, or you can use any third party if it's expensive file concur. Then it goes to your ERP system, if it's uh, Oracle or Xero or whatever ERP or accounting software that you are using, or EMS, and then we do integration to that platform. 
And the first interface for that platform, we call it AYA. AYA is automatic invoice analyzer designed by my partner, Roy Shikrut, PhD from MIT Post Boston for computer vision. So this is a very unique technology based on artificial intelligence. And we do handshake between the image and the original invoice online. And then we reclaim the VAT on countries. So today we are on the enterprise level and SMB down the road, the same technology can be for the consumer. So we are building our hub on the, right, on the left side, you can see all the accounting software that we are integrated with. The right side, you see all the EMS software, uh, main leaders on that part. And the idea is to giving the opportunity to any company around the globe to reclaim the VAT to our platform. So uh, we have more than 100 clients, mainly enterprise. We have like more than a few hundred that are SMB. We established in 2016. Uh, we have two offices, London and Tel Aviv. We are the only vendor in the world that has few patents on artificial intelligence based on the VAT reclaim, and these are investors. We are happy to cooperate with the top players of the travel industry, uh, and I'm here to meet you guys. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye. Okay, uh, next one we have uh, Servant Trip. Uh, will be presented by Andres Varela. So here he comes, my three, mi three minutes of fame. Shalom Tel Aviv. Shalom. I'm Andres coming from Spain, and I'm here to introduce you the one stop shop for service as a destination. Following Focus Right, 1.2 billion people travel around the world in 2015. 1.8 billion will do it in 2030. 70% of these people are still booking those, any kind of service uh, through traditional travel operators uh, like travel agencies with branches or tour operators. Distribution seems to be simpler after so many years for flights and hotels. But this is just pre-arrival. What happens once you get there? That's the big question, and this is uh, the big thing on what happened at destination. Um, booking services at destination seems to be really complex for travel agencies. Let's say that ground transportation, tours, activities, ticketing <clears throat> providers are very fragmented, atomized depending on regions, and mainly focused on B2C. And on top of that, there is lack of uh, transparency and lack of connectivity. But the opportunity is huge. <clears throat> Following, again, focus right, is worth $200 billion uh, in 2020. So this is when Servantry brings to the scene this ultimate technical solution, a one-stop shop to find all the available offer for transfers, hourly drivers, tours, and activities in a one happy only effort of integration. What's the secret sauce? Well, mainly full available offer, uh, consolidated and standardized. Secondly, a one happy only connection. And of course, artificial intelligence apply to customize the offer. <clears throat> so the perfect marketplace to find the better channel distribution, whether you are a travel agency, an OTA, a bed bank, a hotel chain, uh, an airline company, any kind of vertical on the, <clears throat> on the market. You can compare prices, you can book, and you can pay uh, on a very seamless way through our platform, whether it is transfers or activities. In a uh, user-friendly booking platform where you can get full control from booking to payment, a proven and scalable solution distributed already by Amadeus and accessible by 65% of market shares in terms of travel agency branches in Spain. But we want to grow in partners, internationally speaking. So are you a partner or a investor? Just join us in order to shape the future of this industry of uh, services at destination. And if you want to try us, just get one of those uh, butcher codes discount with the 10% that you can use whenever you want. Thank you very much. Toda.
Thank you, Andres. Next one, uh, Service Friend, will be presented by Shachar Benami. Okay, um, so we are a service friend and uh, we established a company asking ourselves a very simple question. Why the heck we are not giving the travelers uh, to communicate with us the same way they communicate with their friends? Uh, in Israel and in Europe it will be mostly in WhatsApp. Uh, in other places it will be in Facebook Messenger, WeChat, and um, this is what we do. So basically, uh, we develop um, a technology which is a combination of artificial intelligence and thousands of people that are working side by side with the AI to provide a pretty impressive and accurate uh, conversational interface. So providers, uh, there are some here in the room that work with us, uh, can provide to the travelers an opportunity to converse with them anytime in their preferred communication channel. Uh, one of the things we saw in the data is that if you allow your travelers to communicate with you, for example, over WhatsApp, 70% of them, actually 79% of them, uh, will no longer communicate in any other channel. Actually, myself, um, as running a small company, I'm using uh, travel services from a company called Amsalem Tours, and I have a person there handling all my travel offers, and WhatsApp is the only way for me to communicate. I never go to my website or anything else. I'm just conversing over WhatsApp and getting what I need. So this is exactly what we do. So we help, for example, here we have uh, Carson. Uh, we help them and we have a bunch of others. As Israelis, you can try to talk anytime with El Al over WhatsApp. It's also service friend technology. Um, actually, this is a very interesting slide from uh, the folks from Intercom that actually they pioneered the web chat and saying chat was great, but it's now history. So you better get ready all the providers in the room uh, for this pretty unique communication channel. The most uh, unique thing about this communication channel is basically that the provider and the customer can communicate while not being online at the same time. And that's great, tremendous value for both. There was in the past few years a big hype around chatbots and all that. We don't deal with chatbots, although we've been the first chatbot uh, case study when Mark Zuckerberg announced on the main stage we've been there as the case study. Uh, it's not about chatbots, it's about giving people the way to communicate in their, really, once again, in their preferred communication channel. Um, in service one, we develop a unique um, experience. We call it the HB, the hybrid bot experience. It's a hybrid experience, it's not exactly a machine, not exactly a human. So when a traveler is conversing uh, with one of our endpoints, he or she does not know whether they are talking with a machine or a human. By the way, if they will ask, who am I talking to? They will get an answer, something like, I'm a technology supported by real people. What does it mean? Nobody really understands, but uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the notion. So, for example, today every uh, Facebook employee or, uh, that needs to book a travel, uh, business travel, uh, they are no longer calling the contact center. They are uh, conversing with one of our hybrid called Reese, and the feedback you can read yourself is pretty impressive. So, if you want a little bit more information, I'm here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shachar. Next, we have Top Agent by uh, Snir Tuzali. Okay, hello everyone. I am Snir Tuzali, CEO and founder of uh, Top Agent. I want to uh, start and ask about the old travel agencies that are here. What is your dream about management software? What is your dream? And I ask this question, I think, uh, about 100 times or more. And uh, every time I receive one question, one answer. We want one comprehensive solution that have booking engine that we can buy the flights all type of flights, if it's low cost, if it's from uh, GDS, all type. We want hotels, we want cars, we want uh, to compare the results from other suppliers. 
We want trails, cruise, attractions. A comprehensive booking engine that give us uh, one place to invite to order and booking and make our bookings and compare to buy in the in the best price we want a CRM that we can send automatic messages in WhatsApp in SMS in email to our customer think about uh, our customer that go he have today flight and receive from you message that uh, have a good flight or we have uh, when he back from his flight he received message, how was your flight? And, and it's important for you, for you his answers, and you receive it for your CRM. You have automatic flight check-in. It's not matter which airline, it's work with all airlines uh, in the world, even low cost. Today you sell, even it's a uh, half year uh, more, and you only check one, one click, and you have automatic uh, check-in. Your uh, customer received the flying ticket, received to his email on 24 hours before the flight, and one big back office software that we can do everything there about automatically vouchers, automatically invoices, automatically uh, charging, and a lot of uh, more information. And after I explain about all this, we have another one big problem, because today in each travel agency, we have a lot of uh, departments, and each department need different software. And our, the CEO, and the, the whole management team need five or four, four or five or six software to, to look about, to receive real data about our company. So we are develop one comprehensive uh, software for incoming and in, in our in-country tourism, outgoing groups business, even for world sellers that want to manage uh, inventory, and for retailers. So it's one big comprehensive solution. By the way, I don't mention it, but in our booking engine, we can see a lot of uh, the great uh, startup that shown up, shown up uh, in the pitch like uh, Sevetrain and uh, RL from uh, Next Travel. Um, this is me. I'm Sneer from Top Agent. This is our name, number and email, and I will be glad to hear, hear and give you uh, more profit. Thanks. Thank you, Sneer. Last but not least. Uh, please welcome uh, Noam Shapiro from uh, Setu. Shapiro. Shapiro. Is this working? Yeah, perfect. Where's the... Click. The walk? Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Noam. I'm the co-founder of Setu. In Setu, we believe that every time a travel product is sold online, there's a consumer concern, and therefore, there's a potential for selling insurance. However, when you talk with online marketeers, they complain about very low conversion rates. The problem, they tell us, is that the insurance products that they sell today are products that consumers don't like and are many times not relevant to their consumer needs, which basically means that they are leaving money on the table. So one would ask, well, why are you here? Why aren't you an insurer tech? It's a well-known fact that the ones that are creating insurance products are the insurance companies themselves, not you. Well, that's exactly why I'm here. I believe that the ones that need to create insurance products are the ones that interact with the consumer, understand them, know their concern, and that's you. So how can you create insurance products? C2. It's that simple. We built a platform that allows online businesses, like online travel agents, to create their own unique insurance product that tap to the, the consumer's concern. The type of products that we are allowing them to create are very simple to understand, have very, are very relevant to the consumer concern, and more important than anything, they have an amazing customer journey. While our platform is connected to external data sources, which allows us to pay the claim to a consumer without his need even to make a claim. Let's see an example for that. A consumer is traveling to Palma de Mallorca. She's doing a weekend in May. However, she's concerned what will happen if it will rain during the vacation. She scrolls down and she's getting a relevant proposal for her. For every day it rains, you get 150 euros. 
A few weeks after, she's on the travel uh, towards uh, Palma de Mallorca, and unfortunately, it rains all through the vacation, four out of five days. At the end of the vacation, she gets an SMS, Gabby, don't worry, we know your vacation was ruined. We are going to compensate you 600 euro that you can use in order to plan your next vacation. But this is just one example out of many types of products that our customer can use to create for their consumers. After a very simple integration into the customer journey, our customers are getting a desktop with a wizard in by which they can create new types of products, customize them, do A-B testings, and many other things in order to make sure that each consumer gets the right insurance product. This allows them to create a new ancillary revenue and create a delightful customer journey. We are live. Our customers are using our products. We are selling, they are selling uh, products all over Europe with using our platform. We are backed by AXA, and we are, take, uh, we are a broker licensed around Europe. We are here to meet online businesses that are looking for ways to create new type of insurance, new type of ancillary revenue, and delight our consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noam, and thank you for all the other startups that uh, we've seen. Uh, next panel, uh, we're running a little bit late, but um, we have a break after this. Next panel is about TMC, Travel, Corporate Travel. Please, panelists, join the, the stage. I would like to introduce uh, Hani Sobel. Hani Sobel, who's going to moderate it. I couldn't find a better place, better person, I'm sorry, to moderate it. Uh, Hani is the CEO of the Israeli travel agencies and consultant. Um, she's been in the industry for a very long time. She's by trade a CPA, correct? Yes. And you were the CFO before of IDP of IDP Tourism, uh, which is Disney House. No, it was, it used to be Disney House. Now it's Israel, the whole group of Israel. Mics. Okay, I let you take it from here. So good afternoon, everyone. These are, these are flourishing times to, for corporate travel. According to the World Bank, international travel departures have more than doubled roughly from 600 million to 1.3 billion over the last two decades. The Education and Research Foundation of the Global Business Travel Association predicts a 1.6 trillion business travel market by 2020. Yet, this is a challenging time for corporate travel. In this panel, small and large uh, operators will examine the trends in the business, such as mixing business and leisure, what we call B-leisure, is here to stay. Corporate travel evolves to come employee first, and business travelers expect an end-to-end -end experience. We will discuss the main challenges that keep them up at night, disruption and changes in business travel, and how technologies can help corporate travel companies bring value to their clients. We will also examine the significant changes in small-medium businesses, corporate travel, a hot area now with large investments in startups companies such as TripAction and Travel Peer. Discussing whether the bigger players are going to control different segments of the market or whether there is still space for regional and local players. And for all of that, we have 25 minutes. So let's start. First, we will start with a uh, uh, short introduction of yourself and your company. Miriam, ladies first. Please. Uh, my name is Miriam Moscovich. I come from BCD Travel. BCD Travel is a corporate travel management company. Uh, they call us a global mega. We operate in uh, over 100 countries and we do it with about 14,000 BCD Travel employees around the world. We also have markets where we are um, working with partners. So here in Israel, Deason House is BCD Travel, so they take good care of our customers here. Uh, and um, I think that's all I have to say. Right? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Alon Zybert. I work for Travel Leaders Group. Travel Leaders Corporate, which is part of Travel Leaders Group. Uh, we're, it's complicated exactly what we are, a collection of travel agencies in different parts, but I'm on the corporate side of things, so we're a TMC. We're not a mega. We don't want to be a mega right now. Not that it's anything bad. Uh, we also work globally. 
Um, and we also have a representation in Israel, Lachish is here. I become a travel leader in Israel. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Gad Sakin. I'm, uh, I work for CWT. Um, you probably know the company as uh, Carlson Wagoni Travel. Uh, the new name is CWT. We changed the name a, few, uh, a couple of months ago, officially. Um, I lead engineering for, um, for the digital department of CWT, uh, based in Tel Aviv. We have a pretty significant uh, development center uh, in Tel Aviv here. Uh, result of an acquisition, Walmate, um, and uh, 18,000 employees uh, over all over the world. Um, also a mega. Also a mega. Bigger than BCD. <laughs> <laughs> Depends who you ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's it. My name is Brian Singer, I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa. I'm from the Singer Group of companies. So we've got two sides to our business. The one side is we own, develop and operate hotels. We've got seven hotel properties in the Western Cape, uh, which is in South Africa. But we are also in the, t in the travel agency business. Um, we're very small players compared to my colleagues here. Um, so we hopefully, I'm hopefully going to add the small player perspective. We have a bricks and mortar uh, travel agency. Uh, typically handling corporate travel. Uh, we also dabble a bit in, in leisure travel, but probably what is more interesting is we formed a group in 2004 where we have 140 offices around South Africa under the Excel Travel brand, and we predominantly are corporate travel uh, TMC um, with approximately 1,000 travel consultants in those offices around South Africa and one or two neighboring countries. I want to add one more thing. My brother from another mother, uh, Julianne from Amex GBT, is here too, the other mega. Um, he does, he's not here on stage, but he's also <laughs> okay. here in this building. <laughs> okay. So I guess uh, what I'm going to ask now is the uh, one million, but it's actually trillion uh, million dollars. Uh, yes. Uh, how come we still have travel agents in 2019? Why are they needed, and how does technology empower them? I really don't believe that I'm asking this question, but God, can you please refer to this question? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I think that if we go back to uh, a few years back, um, when uh, two or three years back, I think that the perception was that, um, that travel agents will be replaced, completely replaced by technology. Um, that was the perception in CWT and I guess that in, in, in other companies, similar companies. And um, in the last uh, year or two, um, we're, uh, getting, we're coming to a conclusion that, uh, that we're still far, far from being there. And, uh, and that the secret for to, to succeed with, uh, at least in business travel, is is to get to the best combination between um, technology and uh, people servicing the travelers rather than just technology servicing the, the travelers. So I think, I really think that it's about uh, people and technology and not just, uh, and not just technology. Um, I have a personal story about myself uh, flying to Phoenix a few months ago and um, my flight uh, left uh, Tel Aviv uh, uh, pretty late. And I missed my uh, connecting flight in, in New York. And uh, the, um, I was stuck in the middle of the night in the airport in New York. And the, the meeting was very important. I had to get to the meeting on time. And um, I tried with the Delta um, uh, uh, desk there. And they, didn't, they, they weren't really very helpful. And at that moment, what I really needed is not an app, is not a website, is not technology. What I didn't needed is a person to speak with. Um, so if you ask me if, if that problem could have, been, could have been solved by technology, the answer is probably yes, uh, could have been. But I, I think that we're still far from being there, and I think that uh, in the next few years we'll sti we still need to invest in the combination between people and technology and not just in technology. Alon? Same question? Yes. <laughs> I think also technology is not there yet, just like God was saying. It's, it's, it's simply not there yet. 
There's so much, and the other flip, the flip side of it is corporate travel is so complicated. And I'm not patronizing, I'm, by my name you know I'm from here. <laughs> uh, but people from here, you don't see, or you don't understand really the corporate world when it comes to you know, scalability and, and numbers, et cetera. It's so, the intricacies of corporate travel uh, is so complicated that the technology is simply not there yet. I'll add that, um, so just do a history lesson real quick. Online booking tools came on the scene about 20 years ago, right? right. So um, in the 20 years that have uh, happened since then, we have roughly, and if you guys have different numbers, please share, but we've roughly moved about half in some markets, all the way up to 70% of business travel transactions are now happening on, happening on some sort of online booking tool. That's all well and good. Um, that's enabled folks like us to deploy our human assets on more high value transactions. We don't need humans to book Chicago LaGuardia all day long. Um, we need humans to handle multi-segment, more complex travel. Uh, that might include multiple modes of travel uh, or multiple stops. I'll, you may not know this, but the average refund and exchange rate for a business travel account is anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of all bookings are changed at least once up until the day of travel. This trip I'm taking here, I've changed it twice since I booked it. I'm going to Atlanta next week as soon as I get home, and I've already changed that booking twice. My schedule changes, corporate travel uh, agendas change, and so um, the, you know, the ability for us to even deal, you said the technology is not there yet, it's still very difficult to do a self-service exchange on a more complex ticket. It'd be great if anyone in the room can figure that stuff out. Um, around the world, at scale, in every currency, at every airline, um, that stuff still doesn't exist. So we still have uh, you know, half of the agents that we had before, but we're hoping to, and what we do is deploy them in a more kind of high value work. And to be honest, travel agents that actually go to travel agent schools, they still have those. Um, they dream of giving service, of customizing the experience for the person on the phone, to find solutions for the traveler, to help the traveler understand is it better to take a train or is it better to fly? And so it, it not only is it good for us to deploy our agents in a more high value way, but also it's great for the emerging talent that's coming through this industry. We're always going to need travel agents, we believe that, but now actually giving them more exciting and more rewarding work to do is kind of, I think, the other side of the equation. So. Okay, Brian, can you, do you want to refer or should uh, we move I'll, to the I'll next question? I'll just add very quickly that I think um, fundamentally why we still exist is because I believe to some extent we re reinvented ourselves. You know, we moved away from just simply taking bookings on instruction from customers, corporate clients, to managing clients' travel accounts and using the technology that's available to us to make that process as seamless and tech savvy as possible. I mentioned at the beginning the, some of the trends of the corporate uh, travels, such as uh, the bill leisure and the end-to-end -end, uh, solution for the customers. Uh, Brian, can you tell us what what you do in order to achieve these goals? So, we, you know, in, in our in our part of the world, we don't really have end-to-end -end solutions that uh, are available to us and that are affordable to us. I mean, there's, there's a currency issue that most of these internationally developed products are priced in dollars, euros, and pounds, and they, they just simply cut too, too far into our margin to make it worth our while. So we're looking for cost-effective solutions, um, and possibly our market in, in you know, the tip of, of Africa is not as sophisticated as, as the rest of the world. So um, you know, we've got most of the t types of systems that, that um, are used globally, um, but possibly not the best. They might be locally developed, um, we find that the international you know, corporate booking tools are just too expensive for us to, to roll out and we've got simpler, more cost efficient uh, versions of those that have developed locally. Um, but I, I would say that we're still a few years away from having an end-to-end -end, uh, corporate solution. Uh, Miriam, uh, you uh, said that you are, you're one of the mega uh, companies. Uh, what are the advantage technology-wise in working with one of the big four? 
I think, you know, scale and geographical coverage is going to be top of mind for any international, multinational, global type of company, right? Um, they're looking usually for services in many countries and many currencies and multiple languages. Uh, they have, you know, all sorts of regulatory issues they need to comply with around the world. And it's harder for sometimes a smaller agency to be able to meet the scale and also be able to have the subject matter expertise around the world. So I think those are the big, um, big benefits. I think I in our awesome. yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think in our industry, um, opposite to what Ron was saying earlier, size does matter <laughs> in our industry. So leverage for pricing, sure. for you know when we pick up the phone and call an airline, yeah. they answer. Okay. So, what about the small medium? <laughs> yeah, we're not that small medium, but uh, the, uh, <laughs> the yeah, medium. I think that the. Uh, uh, global coverage is probably the biggest advantage uh, and uh, because um, there are probably people here from uh, from travel management from from TMCs from big medium TMCs or familiar with the market it's very very complicated to get to global coverage it's very complicated to work at scale it's very complicated to work with with hundreds of airlines and in, in with the different regulations and so on and so on and this is a big advantage probably the biggest one the second one that I would mention is data. The amount of data that we have is uh, infinite. Mm -hmm. And uh, we leverage the data to provide uh, um, the, be the most personalized um, experience that we can. And we're trying to be in a situation where we know what you need before you contact us. And we try to be proactive and we try to build more tools to be more and more proactive and to, be, to give better service leveraging that data, that data that I think that is not uh, that small companies, small companies don't have. I want to comment something real quick. Miriam said 20 years ago the um, online booking tool stepped in, right? In my opinion, once the online booking tool stepped in, what we lost as TMCs is the personal connection, personal relationship with the traveler, hence lost the trust. In the last couple of years, we've seen an inundation of travel technologies around the world, and, and a lot of them are here. They come knock on the door or the corporations, which are our customers. But unfortunately, what our biggest challenge is to regain that trust. And another unfortunate, unfortunate thing is historically, TMCs haven't been innovative, haven't been technologically savvy, right? And very few have innovation centers. Right, these two do. Very few are involved and proactive about it, and it's a DNA. So our big challenge is to regain that trust, to regain that relationship with the travelers. How do we do it? That's a whole different panel, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a, a, a right, a, a very big question, how you do it, how you uh, combine the technology with the human touch, how you really give the customers the... Just one thing, I was in a conference yes. a couple of weeks ago where we talk about innovation, etc. One thing interesting is innovation is not driven only by technology. Mm -mm. This is something that people need to understand and here it's hard because everything is around technology. So there's an element that we discussed was human innovation, right? The human element of, of innovation, but it's, it's up to us as well as the technology, not just the technology to drive it. Okay. If yes, I can, please. I can just add to what Alon said. Um, we find that when we when we uh, tendering for large travel accounts, and you know wh one of the questions usually is about our booking, our, our online booking tools, and what systems we've got. Not all companies that ask that question actually adopt the system. You know, they, they tick it off um, that you've got a system, but you know, if, if we were successful with with uh, attaining that account. Um, often they would just deal with us in a, in a sort of offline manner. Uh, and maybe that helps us to maintain the, the personal touch and the, the personal relationship. And I, I think historically, I think we also made a very bad turn at some point, probably about 15 years ago, which is when we launched online booking tools, just kind of put yourself in the head of 
99, 2000, 2001, right? And booking tools came out and we called it self-service. And back then, self-service, we were like, that sounds good, right? Self-service. And the main driver was to take cost out of the operation. It wasn't about enablement. It wasn't about a digital experience. It was about your procurement leader at a corporation wanted to spend less money on travel. And so they said, give them something self-service so the travelers can do it themselves. And we didn't spend, <laughs> right? It was just a kind of a passing of the, of the work. And now we are 20 years later, and I'm going to be honest, you know, there hasn't been a lot of change in the way online booking tools have changed. You know, there's no difference in the booking path, the booking experience, right? When KDS came on the scene six years ago, my head exploded because it was something new for the first time, right? So we haven't done anything. I think self-service is a dirty word in business travel. I don't think that it, res it's, it doesn't reflect what we're trying to do with a digital experience. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't resonate with a business leader anymore when we say it's self-service. So I think as an industry and as, as folks in this business, we need to get away from the idea of self-service online booking tool and start talking about digital enablement, right, that presents a better experience. Because um, it's not about take, we're not in the economy right now, at least in North America, where we're dying to take costs out of the equation. Right now in North America, people are dying to keep their employees. They're dying to hire the best talent. And they're not going to do that if they have a crappy travel policy and a crappy booking tool and a crappy experience. So I think we're, we're just in a different time now than we were 20 years ago when all this stuff made a ton of sense. Yes. You're up. Amen, he says. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, let's move for a uh, couple of questions from the audience. I see that there's uh, uh, one that is really troubled the uh, travel agents. How do you get inventory of airlines which are not on the GDS? See, that's <laughs> when, when OBTs, because when OB, believe it or not, it's still a lot of manual work mm -hmm. on the agent side. Of they course, go we know to it. They go to a website, whether it's Suabes, whether it's, you know, whatever it is. That's not just airlines, by the way, any content. And they bring it manually as a passive segment into the GDS. For those of you who don't understand what I'm talking about, Good. don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lucky for you. But it's manual work. Yeah. And the reason is because the technology is not there yet. Uh, somebody talked from the startups, talked about it, putting everything together under one, you know, interactive, very cool, intelligent user interface. Uh, the other side of it is because third parties control, the OBTs control the interaction with the travelers, we rely on them. If I have a provider here that I love to get their content to my customers, I have to go to Concur. And if you want to ask Concur to add another content provider, fine, call them back in two years. Yeah. Three. Well, I, mean, I think that's I think that's why you see a lot of corporate uh, travel agencies investing in their own booking solutions. Um, I think you guys are. Um, I know that we are, uh, and um, because we are kind of beholden to the choices that the online booking tools make. I'll also say that it's an interesting situation TMCs are in. Right, this won't, may be a surprise to you. We have a very very funny. Uh, you know, balance of power and a very funny revenue story in, in, in the travel management world. You know, travel management companies, we make our money from our customers and we also make our money from, from commissions, right? So um, we're kind of, kind of in the middle of, of, of two parties and the airlines don't always want to distribute their content in a democratic way, right? We all know this story about Southwest Airlines. Um, they'd rather nobody comparison shop against mainline carriers because then everyone would know that their pricing is basically the same as American Airlines um, where they compete, right? So th there's a whole variety of reasons why the airlines don't want to play. My big concern today is really about NDC and how we're going to lead in that space and more specifically, how we're going to protect our customers um, of the dark side that might come from NDC. We all know that there are some suppliers out there who were dinged in the past for pricing stuff higher to people using an Apple computer. Um, right. And right, and when we start having situations where the supplier can directly get very personal information about the buyer, um, it's not gonna take an airline very long to figure out exactly how much more they need to charge 
an executive platinum member um, because they're still gonna take that flight because they're loyal to the brand and want their miles, right? So I think TMCs that are, that are in this space are thinking like not only do we have to deal with NDC, but how do we continue to keep the situation a democracy and how do we protect our customers? Are we gonna be doing you know, private fair shops and then also anonymized shopping and then hidden shopping and all this just to instant audit the quality of the price to make sure our clients are not getting, um, how do you call it, like surge, surge pricing or, or higher prices for frequent travelers who have loyalty and that type of thing. I don't know if you guys are having these doomsday discussions, but we're thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, we have the same, we have the same, exactly the same discussions. We, uh, as, as I mentioned, the, we invest a lot in uh, developing our own booking tool, MyCWT, and um, actually it's, devel it's develop developed by, uh, mainly in Tel Aviv, in the development center in Tel Aviv, mobile app and web app, and uh, one of the challenges that we have is connecting to sources that, that are not GDS. Um, so uh, we connect to multiple aggregator, uh, aggregators, especially for um, uh, budget airlines or low-cost carriers, um, and, but we're looking as a future direction at uh, uh, NDC as well. Um, so just to add, um, so in, in our case, within the Excel Travel Group, we've, we've partnered with a, with a, a tech developer. So we, we are a very big customer of a small developer. Um, he's, he's from Switzerland. Um, but because we're a big customer, we get his attention. And um, so the changes that we need to make in the system, he's, he's quite, uh, thank you, he's, he's quite responsive uh, to us. Uh, so it's not years, it's, it's maybe, in fact, we've personally put some very, uh, strong demands on him to meet deadlines uh, for a particular client and he's been very responsive but this platform sits over the GDS so it, it, it uh, we happen to work with uh, Travelport but it uh, connects to multiple GDS's multiple low-cost carriers all our domestic carriers um, the, the, the direct uh, connect NDC's and the, the question that's up there about Lufthansa um, if I can just touch on that while I'm at it, um, you know, the issue really is that Lufthansa is charging 16 euros surcharge for any bookings through the GDS if one has to book direct. That's one of the questions. What do you think about yeah. Lufthansa approach against the if, GDS? If, if, Don't go there because okay. I think, <laughs> no, because I think that uh, the most, uh, the, uh, another question that is uh, at least nine, uh, that it's relevant is what's the most exciting innovation in corporate travel your company has in experienced in the past year? What's the next big thing? And I would like to add and how you see uh, the corporate uh, travel in how, how you see it in five years from now. So uh, yes, please. One important factor that adds to this mix is in about 10 years, about 90% of corporate travel agents are going to retire. Yes. Okay. Average age is what, 48, 50 something? We got youngsters, huh? <laughs> so uh, so I, add, add that to the uh, mix. No questions about the age of this group, please. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, from my standpoint, to try to answer this question again, for me, the best technology in the world is the technology you don't even know is there. Hence, emotional relevance. This is the biggest innovation in corporate travel that I'm seeing. And it comes from retail mar uh, verticals and the corporate travel is slowly adopting. Emotional relevance, that's my thing. Emotional relevance, yes. Uh, Brian. I, I, think, I think that in five years time, if that's the question, um, is the mic on? It was actually two questions. What is the most innovation that you think about and what will be the in five years? Well, I, I think that um, I'm still dreaming about that end-to-end -end system that allows us to connect with the customers directly uh, to provide the level of service that we need to do and uh, to personalize the relationship. I'm still dreaming about that system and uh, maybe in five years time we'll have it. Um, as TMCs, we don't have the budgets to develop it, I don't believe. Um, but, but possibly somebody out there who's tech savvy will, will do so and will meet all our requirements. Um, where we'll be in five years time, I think pretty much the same. Um, we'll probably have 
rolled out better systems and better technologies, but I don't see us as companies disappearing. I see us still being relevant. Um, we're providing, our service I think will change slightly in that we providing business intelligence to our clients. We're helping them save money. Um, we're not just simply take, making bookings on their behalf. We're providing service. Miriam? I'd say the most exciting in innovation at BCD Travel was our launch of Solution Source. So we have a platform. Uh, we, don't, we can't build everything, and we don't want to be all things to all clients. We have a diverse portfolio of customers all over the world. And so uh, we created a platform for startups to engage with us. We also have a set of APIs that we're shortly going to be making public and a developer hub so that anybody who wants to help our clients save money, travel safer, uh, travel happier, stay more comfortable, um, bring it. Uh, come to our house, build and play with our toys, uh, and, and create solutions that we can bring to our customers. We have no interest in building everything there is in the world. My prediction for five years, um, I... Andromeda Station uh, was launched by Orion Span last year, so there's a hotel in space taking reservations for 2021. I predict that uh, TTI will be not Travel Tech Israel, it will be Travel Tech Intergalactic, and Ram will be weightless and um, moderating a panel, right, as he floats through the uh, station. As Alon said, amen. <laughs> yes, God. <laughs> yeah, so um, projection first or... Um, last, Whatever uh, suits yeah. you. Yeah, so if I, if I look um, in five years, I think that uh, the industry, w industry will go to a place where, um, where the relief, where employers relieve the need for tradi the traditional uh, policy and the traditional control on, on the travel programs and replacing it with te technology that uh, ensures that, uh, that the, the TMCs sell what is good for, for the employee and what, and what is good for the employer. Um, I think that that's the direction that I'm seeing and that's actually a, um, um, uh, an area where, where CWT is invested pretty uh, uh, significantly. Okay, so uh, we will meet here uh, next year, not on five uh, years. Thank you very much for you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hani, Miriam, Alon, Gad, and Brian. We actually, we are running a little bit late, no so we are gonna skip uh, the break. You were bad. Bad, bad, eating too long, but you're gonna get a longer happy hour. Um, so we're gonna move to the next, to the next panel, um, and the next panel gonna be moderated by by Chena Mishai from Innovel that I introduced before, and it will be about different ecosystem around the world. So please uh, join uh, Ilanit Malkiorto stage, Jacob Christian Ipland, Brian Marinen, and John Boyson. Joe, where is Joe? Where is Joe? Okay, we wait uh, two minutes for Joe from South Africa. <laughs> Don't blame South Africa. <laughs> Maybe he's running after a deer or something. Okay, um, okay. So I'm Chen from uh, from Innovel. I'm a, a CEO of Innovel. Thank you all for coming to Travel Tech Israel 2019. Um, and today we have with us uh, Ilanit Malkio from the Jerusalem Development Authority. We have uh, Yako, uh, Christian Eipland from wonderful Copenhagen. Uh, and Brian Marinian from Journey Partners in, from Dublin. 
Uh, and soon we will have uh, Joe Boysen from uh, Future Nears South Africa. Okay, so thank you all for coming. Uh, today we will talk about uh, the different uh, trends and ecosystems uh, in your region. Uh, hello, Joe. How are you? Did you rest? Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, so, um, uh, so before we start, uh, can you please uh, uh, tell us a bit about your position, what you do, and uh, the ecosystem that you are representing? Ilani, please. Um, I run the most challenging ecosystem, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it's challenging because it's a city that had a very bad reputation uh, from a lot of reasons, but mainly because of security. And for the past 10 years, after a very um, accurate methodology that was developed by um, a small team, including myself and the former mayor of Jerusalem, we have managed to actually change the image of the city working with the cluster, with the community, and overcoming a lot of obstacles and turning the obstacles or the weaknesses into opportunities. Um, so today we can see from tourism point of view that this, the, the community is very involved, that the ecosystem is really working together, not only trying to promote Jerusalem as a tourism destination, this is one challenge, but I think more than that is a city that has the know-how, uh, that is still old, uh, a lot of heritage, 3,000 years of history, but at the same time very innovative, and there's a lot of young people that wish now to be partners or to be involved in the tourism, but from different angles. Not to be hoteliers, but to be the one that make the apps that will help the hoteliers. So in that way, we as, as, as a municipality and a government, we are trying to encourage that more and more. Um. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jakob, you're also, also a DMO yep. uh, of Copenhagen. Can you please uh, describe the activities that you are making in your ecosystem? Yes, I can. And I don't know for the ones who doesn't know what a DMO is. It's a destination uh, marketing organization slash destination management organization. We uh, promote Copenhagen to foreign markets, India, China, US, so forth, uh, as well as uh, manage the destination, the partnerships between the, the different uh, private uh, companies in Copenhagen, as well as the municipality. Um, I, on a day-to-day -day basis, run uh, like this program we call Tourism X, which is a national project uh, uh, between uh, how do you say, uh, yeah, like we have 46 startups across the nation, 24 in Copenhagen, which I manage. Uh, it's like an accelerator program. Uh, it's a three year program for where we take the startups through uh, about six months um, uh, of accelerating. What are the, the role in this accelerator? What do for, they do? For the DMO? Yeah. Uh, but basically we, uh, we it's both early stage as well as uh, small medium companies. Uh, we help uh, take their product uh, and concept and fine tune it and introduce it uh, to the market uh, and test it with users so they can uh, uh, present it to investors and, and have the best case uh, to them. Yeah. Okay. Um, Brian. Hi. Sure. Uh, you are from Dublin. I'm from Dublin. Representing yeah. the Irish people. <laughs> <laughs> Two of us up on stage, it's great. Um, yeah, so from Dublin, Ireland, the, the birthplace of things like Duty Free, that's where it was invented. The first ever aviation leasing company was in Ireland. A quarter of all the world's aircraft are now registered out of Ireland. Um, there are Europe's largest airline, Ryanair, Aer Lingus, which is an incredible heritage. Um, and then on the travel side, Hostel World, who you heard, Car Trawler, um, Openjaw, Datalex, a whole host of companies. So there's this kind of hotbed in Ireland of the whole travel space, but we've never actually made anything of it. Um, so that's been something that we've been looking at for the past couple of years in terms of how do we actually take advantage of that as a nation. We set up uh, the first early stage accelerator around that. 
and have brought 20 companies together, invested in them from all around the world and uh, developed into those. And then my company, Journey Partners, also works with several other ecosystems. So particularly, we're concentrating on Latin America at the moment and the developments there. So I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Joe, tell us a bit about uh, South Africa. I don't think that uh, many here uh, knows exactly what's going on in South Africa in terms of uh, the ecosystem in general. Hi guys, um, I'm Johannes Boysen. I'm from Future Nears. I'm the founder of Future Nears. We accelerate emerging market startups by investing in um, in um, expertise, our expertise, our knowledge, and capital. So very much like Jacob's business, I think um, we we are accelerator. A new word that I've just came across is venture builders. That's a new term. So, South Africa as a, um, as, as a startup, you know, it's not a startup nation. I think um, what happened in the past, you know, since the, the, new, the new regime and since apartheid, um, you know, the last 20 years, it was opened up to the rest of the world. And I think we delivered some of the best entrepreneurs in the tech space, um, Elon Musk and Rudolf Buerta and many others, you know, are very um, well-known South Africans. So what we really found is that there's gems in South Africa. The culture is, for some reason, it's almost like a coal mine. You know, you find diamonds there. It's just because of certain pressures in society, certain uh, needs for, uh, you know, that, that, that forced us to elevate. Um, made very, very good entrepreneurs. So what we're constantly doing is finding those gems, trying to find these emerging market gems, and then uh, provide them with expertise and then scale them. My background is, um, you know, we build uh, lots, of, lots of startups, and in our group we've got about 20 different startups or businesses that we, we um, sometimes we use them as a force together to break into markets like tourism. I'm How do you see the, the travel tech uh, ecosystem in your, mar in your market? You just um, partnered with, uh, with an Israeli company to leverage the technology over there. Do you think that uh, the travel ecosystem over there is just beginning or it's uh, evolving? What, what do you think is the status of the travel tech industry in your market? Um, I think it's in the you know it's in the beginning. It's right from in an the investor beginning. perspective, of yeah. course. Uh, from an investor's perspective, I think it's it's uh, it's still virgin territory. We recently invested in Israeli technology, and exactly what I just described. You know, we find not just uh, emerging market entrepreneurs or technology trying to find the best tech in the world and bring it to emerging markets, not just emerging markets, because they they function differently. So taking um, this Israeli technology and what, what Eliotech has done into South Africa, we could be very disruptive. We, st we just started uh, one of the OTAs, which we believe will be a, a market leader in, a, in what we're actually trying to do is see how, how quickly we can get it to market lead. Because there's certain very unique attributes that this tech ha technology have that we haven't seen in South Africa. So, also, but, uh, but that would apply to other emerging markets as well. And also by, uh, and what your question about the ecosystem in South Africa, I think it's, uh, it's really time to get in there. I think Cape Town is, a, is an awesome destination. So do you see sh uh, an opportunity for other Israeli startups to enter the South African market? Absolutely, yes. And I think that's one of my biggest passions. Um, to link Israel with South Africa, to build a bridge between South Africa. It's something that I know, that no, I heard no one speak about, but uh, it's on the same timeline. The people are very similar. Um, the people are hardworking, the cultures are very, you know, uh, um, very similar in some sense. So we're looking forward to a, like a, a, a in-depth co collaboration with Israel, and that's one of my missions while I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, Ilanit? Um, 
The, the GDA, Jerusalem Development Authority, uh, uh, offers uh, many incentives and grants to entrepreneurs uh, in, the in, in companies in, in two major fields, hotels and uh, conventions. What about the travel tech ecosystem? How do you support the travel tech ecosystem? I think we, um, it was two or three years ago that I realized also based on this uh, long conversation uh, with Rome uh, and the, this travel uh, tech summit that we need as a city to do something uh, that will really encourage uh, young startup to uh, work in the tourism. And I want to tell you that Israel is the start of nation. But I think that if you look at the map of Israel, you would find that there is certain quality that are based in different region on a different cluster. So for example, Be'er Sheva was very is very much attached now to cyber. And if you ask someone about Tel Aviv, so it will be a different kind of startups. So when I look at Jerusalem, what I think is that we, do, we have two competitive advantage. One would be on medical, because we have strong hospital, a very strong academia, the Hebrew University is ranked number one, in, in the 100 uh, number on the world, but also from tourism point of view. So a year, two years ago, I, I established uh, JET, the Jerusalem Entrepreneurial Travel Hub, that you've been there yesterday. And we were questioning ourselves, what should be the ID of JET? Should we be an accelerator? Um, is it our role as a government or as a municipality to invest, to make exit? No. What we figured out was that we have to enable this platform to work, to meet, but also to define where were the strengths of the t of from the tourism point of view uh, of the city of Jerusalem. So we find two angles. One was everything with food tech. You had an early session today about restaurants, and Jerusalem is very strong in its culinary ascent. But from a uh, technological point of view, it's, still, it's not there, even though a lot of tourists are coming, consuming that, but it's not managed in that way. So this is one platform that we really want to establish. The other one would be uh, everything um, around um, security, because we know a lot of destinations around the world that are suffering from either threat or hurt by different kind of security, whether it was Brussels, London, uh, Copenhagen, <laughs> and Jerusalem, of course. So we are saying that if those are the assets that we know how to deal with, why not kind of manage it together um, in Jerusalem, but also with the world, learning about their needs and then so doing something about it. So I think that it's very important not just to do a general accelerator. It's important to define what are the needs of the community. What can we give as a city or a government that they should not interfere but should help? And where is the uniqueness for each one of us in what of kind of knowledge and information they bring to the world in this dialogue. So I don't want to do what you are doing in Copenhagen or you are doing um, in South Africa. I want to do what we are strong at and then having this dialogue with the world and you know, kind of promoting that. Okay. Um, Brian, we see, uh, we see in Dublin, or in Ireland, we see uh, many of the big companies going into, in, into Ireland from different reasons, uh, like uh, Google, Facebook, and so on. Um, do you think it has an, any influence on the, on the ecosystem on, uh, in, in Dublin or in, in Ireland? In terms of the travel tech ecosystem? In terms of travel of tech in, in general as well. Yeah, no, it does, absolutely. It, it was one of the stated aims by the Irish government when they started to really focus on foreign direct investment to um, build a whole talent base that actually recycled into the ecosystem. Um, so back in the early 90s, um, we had come out of a really nasty recession and uh, we put together the first kind of national strategy group to decide what we should be focusing on. 
and our kind of three key factors around that became um, a focus on lower taxation rates and creating a solid low corporation tax rate that was attractive. The second one was on talent, and we've invested more European money in funding than any other European country, uh, or in, in education and, uh, and talent programs than any other European uh, country. And the final then was on, uh, we've split it into two. One was focused on life sciences, and the other was focused on technology. But we wanted to be the place to scale. We couldn't be Israel, as you mentioned. We couldn't be the startup nation. We wanted to be the scale-up nation. So we focused on being the commercial end and attracting all that talent into Ireland. Um, we didn't have the engineering background and that kind of strength that Israel has. Uh, and therefore, whilst we do have some very good engineers... Why, why is that? Is that because of the engineers prefer to go to the big companies? Uh, so the engineers do go to the big companies, but actually 70% of the big companies are commercial people. They're salespeople. So we import talent from all around Europe and further afield to sell those uh, companies' products internationally. Um, what's really interesting is we're now getting that talent recycling into the startup ecosystem. And as I think happened in Israel, in, from the analysis I've done, a, a diversity of people coming all the way, uh, all from all around the world into one spot, I think created a whole bunch of new ideas. Um, the same thing is starting to happen in Ireland. And we're starting to see those people come together and think about problems differently and solving them in different ways. Um, so I think it's a, it's a big breeding ground for, for that to happen. Um, and if I would refer to the ecosystem, still you, Brian. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, uh, what the travel ecosystem or, uh, or the trends that you see in, in Ireland? Um, I think I, it, it, travel is a global place, right? Uh, I, I think it's hard to narrow down by ecosystem what uh, is coming out of them. We're seeing less in terms of the OTA. Um, I think you're seeing more of that in emerging markets and, and trying to develop things that were established elsewhere. And we're seeing lots of Me Too's uh, in, in more of the emerging markets. What we are seeing is more around security. We're seeing more around um, application of big data and artificial intelligence into uh, decision engines. Um, and we're seeing an awful lot more uh, Ireland's always been strong in the back office of things, um, so really making things really efficient. Um, so that's something that we probably understand well and develop on. Um, those would probably be the main trends. Yeah. Um, Jacob, uh, we know that um, uh, Copenhagen is one of the most touristic uh, cities in uh, in Europe, and uh, in 2020, your facing some sort of uh, over-tourism. How do you um, use startups to tackle this problem or to get ready for this problem? So in, in uh, the program we are running at the moment, uh, two of our clusters have a focus on over-tourism and how to spread out uh, tourists uh, in the city because what we experience is if the capacity is a maximum of 100%, Right now we have a capacity, like we're, uh, we're at about 72%, but it, for the citizens in the, in the city center, it feels like 140% because they're all in the center. Uh, they're all moving between the same 10 um, attractions. Uh, and it comes down to that people, they, they prepare themselves from home, they, they check out uh, websites and so forth, but when they go to a city, they do like this and like, oh, please offer yourself to me, city. <laughs> and, and, and basically, uh, they ask the receptionists of a hotel and, and they, they, they look at uh, maps and so forth, but they will move around the 10 largest attractions. And, and that is a problem because tourism is only going one way and it's up. As I think someone mentioned earlier, you see that I think it's about yeah, 9, 10% of Chinese have a passport. And as the middle, middle classes grow, you see the same in India more and more travels will come, which is also why we as a destination marketing organization are slightly changing direction because we don't necessarily need to uh, advertise or communicate about Copenhagen in the same amount that we have done before to the markets, but we have to be better at just managing the place, uh, the attractions and the collaborations between the partners of the city. 
Uh, on top of that, when we're talking about trends, uh, we also see that the consumers or the visitors to the city are becoming much more uh, aware of the sustainable uh, level of the city. Like we do have a sustainable brand in Copenhagen uh, and Denmark in general. So it's important for us to maintain that uh, also uh, like working with tourism. So that's like two, two uh, major things for us in the coming years. It's definitely over tourism and sustainability. Uh, they are, they are expecting around uh, 10 million hotel beds in, in We have uh, 12, mili 12 million uh, uh, bed, bed nights bed right nights, now. So, yeah. Yeah. Ah, right now. Right now. And we're, I think, uh, as far as I remember, we have a, a, a nice growth. So we expect like 15, 16 visitors million. Uh, versus two million uh, uh, population in, in Copenhagen. Yeah, well, well uh, yeah, Copenhagen mistaken. is about a million. Uh, right. It always depends on how you look at a city, right? But like, if you take the city center, it's about like somewhere between five hundred thousand and seven hundred thousand. Uh, the larger, further you go out, your greater Copenhagen is about the same size as uh, Hamburg, like four point two million. Um, Ilanit is a government and non-profit organization. Uh, why is it so important for you? to work with the travel tech ecosystem and uh, what would you like to achieve? Um, I think that it's another layer uh, when a destination wants to promote themselves as a tourism destination. It's not only about how many tourists are coming, I'm counting how much money they spend, how many overnights they have in the city, it's important. But I think that if you are looking really at the ecosystem and you're thinking about education and you're thinking about um, the other players in the industry, whether are the restaurants or the attractions or the galleries or whatever, this whole mechanism have to work together. Um, it was very interesting to hear you, from you about how you want to manage the capacity of, the tur of tourism, right? So they, this is not a problem for Jerusalem. You can send them over to me. <laughs> but what I do have as a challenge, as a city, is that the narrative of people coming to the city was on the bus, off the bus, going to the old city, and mainly going to free attractions, even though we have museums, we have um, hotel, uh, we have restaurants, etc. So how do you educate the consumer or the tourist to actually spend money in a, in a city that has more than 65 different museums, small and big. So what I'm saying here, that in order to really utilize the tourism and the fact that Jerusalem have been putting uh, itself to work on the cluster of tourism, then we need to work together with all the ingredients. And when you have young people changing Another challenge that we had in the city was to change the kind of tourists that are coming. It was mainly uh, more uh, a third generation people. It was mainly from United States. It was mainly Jews and Christians. So suddenly we had to shift it to FITs. And suddenly we started to get millennials. And then we got from China. And they are young. So if I have young people to inspire them to walk with them in the city, but also that are making different kind of technologies. It's another way to consume the city and it's help branding the city as an interesting place. <coughs> you spoke earlier about the conferences. So yes, we have this whole department who is dealing with the CBB or the, the uh, bringing more conferences to the city. One of the challenges that I found out is that we are all going to different summits and conferences. We always pick up a lot of business cards. We always lose them. We always lose the content. And what do we wanted to follow up with these people, right? So now, in the CVP of Jerusalem, we're not only offering grants to come and make the conference in the city, but we're also offering a whole technological package for a conference organizer. So you will get tools from us how to uh, actually attract more people to sign to your conference, how they will start to interact in between themselves before they come to the conference, and the follow-up once they are leaving. We are providing this technology. It's not that we invented it as a city. We just collected the wisdom from the players, and we were just wrapping it and giving it a branding and a promotion. So in that way, I gained twice. I gained the conference, but I also managed to brand myself 
differently from other destinations that are trying to attract conferences to the city. So. Okay. Um, as we as we know, or as, as we say in uh, in the world, there are four pillars uh, in the in an ecosystem. Uh, one of the pillars are the investment side. So, Joe, can you please uh, tell us what are you looking in startups specifically uh, when you decide to invest, and uh, what would you like to gain by uh, investing in these uh, startups? Okay, normally um, I, my philosophy is 70% uh, uh, is the jockey or the, the, the founder or the driver of the business. A lot of times you, you could come to a business and we get lots of pitches and lots of people approaching us and uh, you know, a lot of times the technology is great but the jockey is, you just want some, you know, you just want to add stuff to him, you know. And also that is what we do. Um, but we, I think, uh, um, Primary, a jockey is, 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 is the most important factor. And then the technology, once you start analyzing technology, obviously the uniqueness of the technology, scalability of the technology, how easy it is to scale, how easy it is to integrate, and you know, what's unique about it. And, and you know, we all know the protection aspect is not, you can't protect technology too much these days. So time to market is, is, is your main, you know, main priority. So if you find the right jockey, the ability to scale him uh, quickly is, is, is th those, are, those are the things we look, look for. Wonderful. Uh, Brian, um, okay, let's uh, go to uh, the question uh, about advice for startups when dealing with corporates, advice for corporates when dealing with startups. Uh, okay. So corporates have brought us on board because they're just terrible at this. Um, really, really terrible. We're finding that the average sale time into an airline is 18 months for a startup. If and they were in any other industry, that would be ridiculous. Um, so actually just keeping cash going for a startup is really a struggle. Um, so what we've been doing with a variety of different organizations is creating lower pathways to come in, where they get to pilot uh, little parts of their products and uh, and get small payments for that. Um, so that's definitely challenging. Um, the corporates just don't understand the need to move at speed, um, particularly in aviation and travel. It's just a slower moving sector. So I think people have to accept that to a certain extent. Um, in terms of corporates getting in, find your internal champion. That's, that's the key thing. Find the person who really understands the commercial value of what you're bringing and make sure that they're driving home for you internally. They've got to communicate the politics of the organization to you and who makes decisions and who will be your potential blockers. And you need to understand all that. I think one of the things we're understanding about the Israeli ecosystem is tech, obviously, is incredible here. Um, but probably the understanding of travel hasn't been as strong. And you guys are doing great work in that area. Um, but there's probably more knowledge to be built around how does the structure of this organization actually work, who makes the decisions, and how do I start to manipulate myself into that whole process. I think that's probably the best place to start. Okay, uh, we have to finish. So quick questions from one to 10, 10 is the best. Uh, in your opinion, how advanced is the travel industry in terms of uh, innovation versus other industries? Jacob. Four. Four? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it's between seven and eight, but awareness is about four to five. Three. Five. <laughs> You're all cheap. <laughs> okay, um, I think it's two actually, but anyway. Uh, from one to ten, in your opinion, how ready is the global travel industry for open innovation model? Can I say, yeah, uh, if I have anything to do with it, very ready because we're gonna be setting up the fir world's first open data airline in the next 18 months uh, in South America. So hopefully 10. <laughs> I would say eight. Elenit? 
Seven to eight. Jacob. I'm going to go for the diplomatic uh, five. Five. Uh, <laughs> okay. Depends. Last one uh, from one to ten. If you could score your local travel tech ecosystem, how would you grade it? Jacob. The local travel ecosystem. Travel tech ecosystem, right. Well, now I'm part of like pushing it, uh, but we're just starting out, so I've got to say five again. Uh, but uh, ask me again uh, next year. Okay, I, I will, actually. Uh, Elenit? Uh, six, but we want to be ten. We will be there in a year. I like that you point at me when you say ten. <laughs> I right. can't. I, no, I'm going to say nine on this one, just because, yeah, that would be over the top. I know, I think we're pretty good at it, but we, we, we still need to, to keep pushing on it. I would say three. But uh, I'm excited about it because yeah. uh, I think we're building it. Uh, we understand that South Africa has a long way to yeah, go. So yeah. but I think we, we're going to build it the next uh, couple of years. So I'm very excited about that. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hen, Ilanit, Jacob, Brian, and John. Um, so. Last but not least, now for all the people that were here since the morning and wanted to ask Maggie all those questions about the OTA and distribution, this is your time. So I'd like to call again uh, Maggie Rock for the, who going to lead this panel and moderate it. Also, we have uh, Pierre Ben David, um, Max Cherkov, Andy Morris, and Gok Kim. Everybody is here because we are, we are, we change a little bit the schedule. So this is our last panel. Normally we keep the best for last. Um, you like the OTA, you don't like them, you want to know about the distribution, but one thing you have to give them, if you talk about travel tech, they are at the cutting edge of travel tech. Um, you know, we can compare it to other industries, it's different. But um, Maggie, who is our moderator, as I introduced her earlier today, she's a senior analyst with uh, Focusrite, based in, um, based in New York. And she's been with them for seven years, done a lot of research that you've seen some of the numbers that she shared with you earlier today in her keynote. And she will include some of it in her question in, and in the content of this specific panel. So Maggie, thank you very much, and take it from here. Thank you, Rob. One thing you got wrong, they don't get to ask me questions. It's my turn to ask questions. So we've got a really interesting group here because we've got sort of a cross section of travel distribution. We've got some different regions represented. Um, in hotel beds, you have a, a major distribution player, uh, a manager of supply based in Spain. And we have a Scotland based and China owned MetaSearch uh, player. And we have a European uh, independent OTA in last minute, and uh, and then it finally, uh, from here in Tel Aviv, a tech solutions provider. I'm going to let them explain themselves a little bit more, but um, different intro questions for for each of you. So, Pierre, you're this big this big player called a hotel be a, a bed bank, yeah, that's right. and it's one of those kind of huge companies that if you're not in travel, you might not be familiar with with the model, and I think some in travel are a little bit confused too. Uh, so you can you give a really quick explanation of how, tel how hotel bits, beds sits within uh, distribution. Okay, so in two sentences, let's say, hotel beds, as you said, is the biggest player now in the B2B sector. So we are a wholesaler of travel. We sell hotels, activities, cars, everything that's related with, uh, with uh, travel, basically. We've been operating more than 20 years. Um, in the recent years, in the last couple of years, we've uh, consolidated the, the three biggest companies in the sector, Turico Holidays, GTA and Hotelbets. So we, we are now, by, by definition, the biggest player in this market. What does it mean, I think, from, I got the sense yeah, from you your question, what does it mean to be a wholesaler yeah. in this travel? So surprisingly, uh, or not surprisingly, there's still a very big business around the B2B sector. So the supply chain means that we are connecting OTAs and travel agencies to, uh, uh, to the hotels. Uh, so we are helping them do business and grow together while offering value propositions to each of the sides. But we'll get to that later on, how we do that. Exactly. Right, thanks. And, and Max, I think you're the most mysterious one up here, um, <laughs> although 
you're local, so maybe a lot of folks know you and your name's on the chair and you're buying us everyone drinks later, some more nice. But um, you, you have a few different products and you work with suppliers, OTAs, and MetaSearch. Um, but can you explain a bit more what kind of technology you're providing? So we're helping travel companies. On, on? I think you're on. Yeah. Yeah, you're good. So we're helping travel companies use different tools that we have to optimize how they multi-source across the hotel supply and then optimize how they distribute that to their channels, partners, point of sales. Um, we start with bringing in multiple hotel inventory providers, be those folks from hotel beds, Expedia and the rest. We then apply various solutions on making the sense of the data that's provided across various those sources. Various solutions. He's still mysterious. <laughs> um, everything that relates from bringing in hotel inventories, standardizing the content, the data, the rate sources, and the rate types, and then optimizing both product display and product pricing. All right, and um, thanks. And, and then Andy, I think your Skyscanner's come up a few times already today, relatively familiar to this audience. Um, but there was a question that came through earlier on the prospects for MetaSearch, and I think your best position in this panel to just to just talk a little bit, I mean, you can give a quick intro to Skyscanner, but I think, uh, again, most know you. So how do you see the role of MetaSearch in travel over the next few years? Thanks, yeah, so great to be here. And uh, I'm, I'm here for the second time. Rom keeps promoting me as a second time customer and, and it's fantastic to be back in Israel. In terms of Skyscanner, by way of an introduction, I think a lot of people are familiar with the brand. We have 90 million unique users uh, uh, on a monthly basis, we have 11 offices, around 1,200 employees, and we are described very much as a meta. Um, and so the march of Skyscanner has been consistent. There's been a lot of growth in the business, and even companies like Skyscanner really have to focus very hard on, on keeping up on, on various different aspects of technology. I think probably one of the biggest challenges for the travel sector and indeed the meta space is the distribution, is the complex distribution that travel tech um, is saddled with. When you look at NDC and GDS, etc., sometimes it's, it's very easy to let go and, and lose the um, really where we should be focusing on, which is the traveler. The traveler's not particularly interested in all of the underlying technology. So I think for Skyscanner, the biggest challenge is, and biggest challenge for Meta, is to continually accurately and honestly reflect um, a very complex market in terms of price um, and availabilities for bookings. So I think that's probably where Meta really is continuing to focus most of its time. Where do you expect to see more change in Meta Search in terms of that challenge you just mentioned of displaying complex products? Uh, there's still a lot to do with hotels, but also on the air side, I think there's a lot of questions about NDC and what are different players going to do. So which one do you think over the next few years uh, presents more complicated problems? So which is the most complicated problem that we all have? That's, 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 that's an interesting way of looking at it. I think that um, NDC offers great promise, of course, in terms of, of, of what we're trying to do. Um, it allows us to deliver technology such as DBook that Skyscanner has been very focused on over the last two, three years. Um, and it allows us to bring faster results and it allows us to bring more accurate results and more comprehensive results. I think there's challenges uh, across various different products being separated on the flight side. So I think LCCs are coming out with lots of different uh, price points. I think reflecting that in the market can be continually challenging. And I think one of the interesting things about a business like Skyscanner and of course other metas is that when you have connected um, 1,200 suppliers to, uh, to a central system, that takes a lot of management, that takes a lot of engineering. And so I think where Meta is, is rightly congratulated is, is creating a marketplace that allows people to get a global view and just keeping up with that technology and keeping up with the distribution is where a lot of our engineering focus is. All right, thanks. And then finally, uh, uh, do I think you have your own mic actually? We have the, oh, okay. Good, hope you guys can share. So Gook, from uh, last minute, one of the- dot com. One of We have to say dot com. I mean, for the brand team, this is like super important for us. So this year we had to go like through an exercise and training course about last minute dot com. Does that mean you don't have an app? No, we do have an app. Okay. We do have an app, we do have an app. Right. But our Let's brand team was very serious about this and they told us, you know, just make sure you keep saying last minute dot com. <laughs> so. Okay, last minute dot 
com. But the window was the, quite expensive, so I actually didn't want that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it was. Um, so one of the last, you know, independent OTAs, and there's been questions bubbling around the room, I think all day, about what the prospects are for uh, your, your type of company. So what, what do you see as the, you know, the, the biggest differentiator for a small OTA? Is it just about being a strong regional player, uh, or what, what can you bring to the table? So I think the difference that uh, lastminute.com has compared to the other guys such as you know, booking.com or Expedia and so on is that we are actually a group of different brands. Within lastminute.com we have Vola Gratis, which is uh, the, pro the, do the dominant uh, OTA in, uh, in Italy, for example. We have Rumbo in Spain, we have Weg.de in Germany. So it's a collection of brands, basically. So rather than just working in the market as lastminute.com, we basically what we decide to do is buy brands, buy OTAs, because the company has grown over the years through acquisitions. And um, I think that's the, the key differentiator. I mean, there are companies like, for example, Expedia. It's true that it's quite big across the world. But for example, if we put uh, dynamic packages for the Italian market, we're actually the market leaders there because the, the people recognize our brand. So they feel more confident in booking with us and so on. So I think that is the key differentiator. But I hope, obviously, in the future, that we're able to innovate in the product lines. We were able to uh, innovate as uh, maybe you know, Kiwi.com is doing that. They're creating their own verticals, their own uh, product lines, and hope we can do that to in, in order to differentiate with, uh, with the bigger boys in the market. All right, and I want to actually open that question up to the rest of the panelists because you all work with uh, folks in all, positioned all over the industry. So um, when we think about Expedia, Booking Holdings, and C-Trip, um, you know, what is the, what is the role that you see smaller uh, players, not, not counting you know, an Airbnb, which is its own entity, but a smaller uh, OTA selling flights, hotels, packages? So I would say, obviously, my expertise is more of the B2B sector, but uh, the local players are our clients. So let's say we see that the trend is true. We see that they struggle with the big OTAs, let's say, and the value proposition from how we perceive it is that they focus, as he mentioned, on the more complex transactions, on more of the personal service and the key uh, advantages that they can offer uh, while comparing to the big OTAs, which has more. All right, I want to, since it's late in the afternoon and I think we could use a little bit of energy in this room, I'm gonna do something I was gonna say for the end. We're gonna play a game, and we have another game for the end later too. Um, so this is one, uh, I don't know how international it is. We play it in the US, um, and maybe in some of those hostels that uh, the Israelis go to, um, you've played this game as well. It usually has three parts. We're just going to use two. If you know the game, you might know why I'm skipping one. Um, I call this game, Marry or Kill. <laughs> okay, you've each got your own special choices. You're gonna marry one, you're gonna kill the other. Andy, you're first. I am already married, so let's see how this goes. <laughs> okay, this is in a corporate well, capacity, right? I think so. <laughs> You've got Tencent or Facebook? Marry who and kill who? Uh, <laughs> marry Tencent, kill Facebook. All right, he safely got through that. All right, Max, you're gonna marry AWS, uh, marry or kill AWS or Microsoft Azure? Loaded question, we're on Azure, so kind of already married there. Not sure we have another option. <laughs> <laughs> I, tr I tried checking this, the site. So, all right, AWS or the Google Cloud? Azure left you. Marry AWS, kill Google Cloud. Um, Gook, you've got marry and kill, Google or Amazon? So I would marry um, Amazon and I would kill Google. You wanted to say more, I'll let you. Did you want to say more? Or did you look, you look like you had something else to say on the topic? Well, I mean, Google, <laughs> uh, I mean, for all the OTAs, I think for everyone here, Google is the, the biggest threat that we have. And uh, they're expanding quickly in the travel industry. And uh, we're quite scared, meaning, I mean, we're not that scared, but I mean, well, what's going to happen potentially you can is say that if, we are. if, uh, if uh, Skyscanner or Kayaks and so on that we're using to distribute our products uh, so comes to, to Google, then we might have a problem in the distribution channel. So I hope it doesn't happen. All right, Pierre, I picked one. You've got some history here. Um, so you've been with one of these before. You have Tui and Thomas Cook. Say again? Tui and Thomas Cook. 
I'll say, uh, well, that's a tough one. I'll marry Tui, let's say. Again? Yes. All right, that's such a beautiful story. Okay, so, <laughs> so let's see a time, all right. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about how, um, how you're all affected by consolidation in the online travel space. Um, for some of you, it maybe means uh, fewer potential clients, and for some of you, maybe it means um, they've got bigger, um, they've got, they've got bigger banks to compete with, bigger uh, pockets, deeper pockets to compete with. Um, any thoughts on how consolidation is affecting your business? So, I think that I'll, I'll pick it from two sides. So, from our own place where we are, and there has been a consolidation in the travel tech space specifically. So, um, Open Job being bought. Um, other company, other tech companies and tech providers being bought as well. Um, personally leaves us as one of the remaining privately owned tech companies that puts both pressures and opportunities. Um, but from our side, I'm seeing opportunities to partner with other tech platforms that want to create a more healthy consolidation perhaps on the tech side and then potentially tap into those larger banks. All right, and Andy, do you feel like you've been more of a have you been more of a beneficiary of consolidation, or is it uh, created bigger challenges for you? Yeah, I'm not. Sure, I'm not sure it's um, sort of mutually exclusive um, like that. I think consolidation in the market is very natural. I think perhaps as travel tech individuals, we're maybe guilty of some inward-looking nature that you know this technology revolution that we're seeing in travel um, is happening in absolutely every other sector that you look at and. Um, that, that's a very natural thing, and so what you will see is that you'll see the early big players start to consolidate um, lots of M&A activity, etc. And then naturally, coming out the other end of that, you'll see natural disruptors coming in at the, the, the bottom of the market in terms of scale. So I think from Skyscanner's perspective, the consolidation simply means that we need to keep an absolute eye on the ball in terms of how we display the options for our travellers. Um, uh, risk of sounding slightly cliched that I think if you look at all the technology battles that we're all involved in, if you keep the traveler at the center of that, then I think that is a, a very useful perspective. And so it's difficult to call whether it's an opportunity or a risk, but it is, it's, it's a constant theme that we have to keep an eye on. And that brings up, so when you talk about, you know, serving the traveler really well um, and displaying options in an interesting way, um, I think that Google has made really huge strides over the last few years and recently had kind of sewn everything together in a way that makes some people a little bit uh, nervous. I get, I get called by reporters way too often, is Google gonna be an OTA? Um, does anyone here think that, that Google might uh, want to get all the way in and compete as an OTA? We can just go down the line, yes, yes or no. I think they're already halfway there? I'd say yes, I agree. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not so sure, I think Google is, th I think the, the thoroughbred of Google is purely in engineering, I think it's a tech business more than anything, so I'm not entirely convinced that they would view themselves in that way, but I'm not sure. But I don't think they will. Uh, the reason why I say that is that, um, I mean, it's a very margin, th thin margins. So I think it's much better to be on the other side and distributing companies like us and uh, make it make do our jobs basically. Um, in order to have a travel agency, that means that you also need to have a customer care department and uh, that's not the culture of Google. I don't think they want to ha hire hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people to service their customers for the tickets and so on. So I don't think that will potentially happen. So the ad business is just a better yeah. business to be in. Yeah. Um, then what, um, in their, even in their present form, I think they do cause headaches for some people. Um, do, do you guys think that they are, are getting in the way at all, stifling competition and innovation? So for me, um, as an OTA, so we're talking about Google, right? Yes. So for me, as an OTA, we're okay for, for the fact that uh, I mean they're innovating in that area. It's pushing the other distributors as well to push in that area as well to make sure that they're providing the best product possible to the users. They're trying to capture more users. They're trying to get more interest from the users. So what that means for us is that we have more uh, audiences to, to reach out to. So for us, it's something positive. All right. I think I'll second that and I think in general, 
while everyone can look at them as a threat, I think they also act as a catalyzer for a lot of companies to push themselves to catch up. Okay, we should move on to another huge player, make sure with time. Um, and, and the next one in my lineup is Amazon. Um, they launched, they've done a few things sort of inching along in travel. So AWS has had a travel practice for a while. A year ago, they, la they launched Alexa for hospitality. I think that looks like a guest experience tool more than anything else. Um, and they recently hired someone uh, formerly with Kayak and OpenTable to the AWS travel team. It looks like they might be doing more. There was this thing in India. So do you guys think that they have you know, plans to include travel in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in their product lineup globally? I think it just feeds into the previous topic of catching up to Google. Amazon's catching up to Google in this respect, or? I think in the travel space, yes. That makes sense. I mean, Google is very visible, has been out there. Um, Amazon has a way, though, of just showing up and, and getting it done. What, what were you think, saying, Andy? I, th I think it's interesting that, you know, I think sometimes when you look at a business, regardless of how big the brand is, what is their core business? One could argue, for example, that um, if, you, if you look at the big four techs, so they're, they're stronger in certain areas. Maybe Apple's not so strong in, in maps as, as Google, some could argue, et cetera, things like that. So it's very difficult to know if this is experimentation or whether or not it's a, it's a pure play for the sector. I think, though, that anything that comes out of other entries to the travel tech sector, if it finds edges and it finds niche and it finds a value proposition from travelers, then, then it should be something that's welcomed. Pierre, would you look forward to working with them and uh, and travel? Of course, we are. Uh, we encourage every you know every opportunity to partner with uh, another distributor OTA. I mean, on our side, I think Amazon. What they're trying to do eventually is that uh, they will become one of the distribution channels. I don't think that they will eventually go inside the the OTA business and actually start ticketing the for the customers and so on. And uh, the reason why I say that is that uh, Amazon, I think they're investing a lot in their Amazon ads service, and uh, probably they see better profit, uh, profit margins there, and it's much better than selling tickets, where the margins, as we all know, in the air, especially in the airline industry, is very, very thin, and I don't think they will want to get in there and uh, get in that whole mess of uh, issuing tickets and all that stuff. What about a platform model? Would they give you a place to sell? your products Yeah, there. so I think eventually what will happen is that they will become probably a meta search engine, uh, probably, because uh, the reason why I say that, uh, as I said, um, on Amazon, people are using Amazon as a search engine now. Um, th that was one of the key uh, insights that I received while reading one of the reports from um, some other companies. But they're becoming, they want to become a search engine. They want to start selling ads, and I think it makes sense for us, for, for them to eventually get into the meta business, maybe. So over the past couple of days, I've been hearing um, Alibaba come up in the next breath right after Amazon, which I think is interesting because Alibaba's in there and they're, they're selling travel. They have been for, for a few years now and they've made a lot of headway. Um, their business is still a lot smaller than sea trips. Um, would you, any of you take that as, you know, is that not evidence that a massive e-commerce uh, platform just shouldn't be trying to be an OTA? I, I don't think necessarily, sorry. I, I don't think necessarily when, when you look at that market and you, and you look at the Far East that I think something which is absolutely clear if you look at the app business over there in the app sector is, and it was discussed earlier today, is that there are organizations over there who have ambitions to be the super app. So it's not necessarily, I think, just necessarily about travel or shopping or e-commerce or music or whatever sector. I think these are our businesses that are trying to occupy much more of our digital life on a daily basis. I think it's, it's probably not necessarily the case that you've got organizations thinking, okay, all of our chips on travel. I, th I think this is multi-pronged from, from the businesses and some of the growth that we're seeing from that market is absolutely phenomenal. And there's a lot that the West and, and the Middle East, et cetera, can learn from that area. But I think it's not necessarily the case that travel is the absolute focus. I think it's occupation of screen time and, and your digital life more generally. Take my words out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that's part of that, the India move. We got to take at least one off the board. Um, the, and people really like this. How can you make it easier for travel innovators to work with you? Is that a question they need to make it easier 
for travel innovators to work with them. Yeah, is that uh, um, so? Yeah. So what yeah, are you doing? I, I, this, is, this is a great question. I think that. So with regards to Skyscanner, with our B2B platform, we power probably 600 brands across the globe. Um, and one of the things that we see time and time again is that people who come in with a very specific problem to solve, people who can actually create a value proposition even for a niche, seems to go further than an organization that tries to build the Death Star, as, as we call it in Skyscanner, trying to, trying to build something that's going to solve everything, you know, this silver bullet that never exists. So if you can find an absolute niche and, and work on that basis, then that's absolutely the case. I think the other interesting um, observation that we have as a strategic partnerships team is that when we deal with API and when we deal with white label, uh, the, the counter is normally correct. The bigger the organization, the more difficult it is for them to build API because the roadmaps are absolutely locked tight. The business is under a lot of pressure. There's a lot of money involved. Whereas actually the bigger the organization, um, white label sometimes seems like the, the best option. So sometimes just making sure that you're working on absolute niche, um, not using everything and just trying to find value propositions small in a small way is, is, is a good way to uh, integrate the Skyscanner. So you guys need need these innovators. Pierre, what are you? What is such a huge? No, I'd say player. by definition, Hotelbit's product was built to integrate. So we have uh, a various or big ecosystem of APIs that allow the partners to connect and to do business together. Not only that, in the in the in the context of the consolidation, we're looking for more and more opportunities to innovate and to be uh, ahead of the market, like uh, using our. Uh, leveraging the consolidation part to be more more innovative. So I would say we are very open to collaborate with others. I'm curious about Gook, Gook's take on this um, working working with innovators as a as a significant OTA, but a smaller one than than the than the hugest. So you maybe have um, less capital to throw at it, yeah. um, but you offer a different environment. So I, I have a startup background, actually. And uh, when I joined lastminute.com, uh, for me, it was a bit scary in the beginning because I'm joining a big corporation. And uh, the first thing I tried to do was always to collaborate with the startups. I think some Israeli companies here uh, know me because, I mean, I try to work with the startup as much as possible. I know how much the entrepreneurs are, you know, it's important for them to work with a company like ours, of our size and so on, because a small integration could basically change the, the course of the company and I understand that. But uh, what I've noticed, the difficulty that I've seen inside is uh, it's very difficult to push p projects internally. Even if you're a higher up, even if you're the CEO, you push down a project, you say, you know, we want to integrate this company and so on. And even if the startup says, you know, it's, we have the APIs, it takes five minutes to integrate and so on, it's super complicated. So, <laughs> I mean, you have to take into consideration so many different departments. Every department has their own ideas, their own values, their own political uh, uh, same to, I mean, they have everything, they have all different ideas, and the person, your sponsor, the person that you're uh, getting in touch with, his job at the end is to basically convince all these departments, and it takes a lot of time, and if at the end of the day it, uh, it doesn't generate enough value, that person will not push forward that project internally. So what's very important, I think, is the first thing is to have patience, try to basically throw, uh, throw your seeds everywhere as much as possible. These discussions will take a lot of time, but unfortunately, I mean, it's, it's difficult to work with corporations. That's what I've noticed so far. We got the gong, but can I do a really quick little lightning round? Okay, this is um, short answers, one word, basically. We'll just go. So, um, most important market for your company this year? China. China as well. All markets, but probably Far East's biggest growth. Probably APAC. Okay. Um, most misunderstood technology in travel? Room mapping. What's that? Hotel room, room, room mapping. mapping. Okay. Most misunderstood technology in travel? Control distribution. Voice. Personalization, AI. Yeah. Biggest travel distribution pain point? Downstream control. I would say the BRG violation, the market price uh, violation, is a big hassle, uh, a big thing in uh, the B2B sector. Cross-platform, small screen, big screen. Too many distributors. I'm sorry, too many suppliers. Well, that's what I meant. These are some great con con conversations for follow-up. Um, but for the last one, more important to the future of travel technology, personalization or the human touch? Then go hand in hand. Pick one. Personalization. 
in the B in the B two B personalization. Yeah. Human touch. The robots aren't coming just yet. I agree with this one. Human touch. All right. Thank you so much, Max and Pierre and Andy and Go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maggie, Pear, Andy, uh, Gok, and Max. So we made it. We're almost there. Um, you can take all those great points and carry them downstairs. We have a happy hour till 5 o'clock. Uh, I just wanted to, a couple of things. First of all, thank the startups. Because really, to be honest, without them, we wouldn't have been here. Even it's very difficult to bring our guests here, but as much as I would like to think that they come to see me or they come to see our lovely country, that's not the case. They come to see the innovation and the startup. So first of all, I'd like to thank the startups. Then I'd like to thank all of our guests that came from overseas. I'd like to thank also our partners and all of our sponsors. Again, without them, we would have been able to do it, but it would have cost me much more money. Um, so. Thank you very much. We hope to see you. We have follow-up, obviously. And for our international guests, we have at 5 o'clock down there, we're doing a tour of the, of the innovation exhibit here in Paris Center with all the great Israeli, um, Israeli um, innovation, which is really nice. And um, we'll message you everything about tonight and tomorrow. And we hope to see you again next year. Probably same place. We like the place. Yeah. Great location. Thank you very much. And please stay in touch. And travel, travel, travel. <laughs>